Okay. Thanks so much, Matt. Hi, good to meet all of you. Um, Yorubun, annyeonghaseyo. Um, I will be presenting in English, so I hope that's okay for everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me, Bidol Asia. Super excited today to talk a little bit about Filecoin IPFS and the very new, uh, newly launched two months ago, FVM, which is the Filecoin virtual machine. Cool. Um, a little bit about myself. I am Sarah. I am the developer experience lead for the Filecoin virtual machine. So we run a team of um, people that are focused on developer resources, developer experience, tutorials, education, uh, to help everyone understand how to use the FVM and how to unlock even more solutions and opportunities on the Filecoin protocol. Um, if you're interested, we have a Twitter account over here as well. Um, this is the FEM Dev Twitter account, and we have a Phil Builders Twitch account, where every Thursday we run through live coding exercises to try out things that we are putting out there and to see if there is anything we need to improve. So do join us. It's a super fun session every single week. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some context of what Filecoin is doing um, and where the FVM comes in today. So we started with, we have this Filecoin master plan. If you know um, our founder, Juan Benet, this is his Filecoin master plan for the whole Filecoin ecosystem. Uh, step one was to provide a decentralized, a large decentralized storage network. So as of today, we have 20 exabytes of committed capacity on the Filecoin network, which is one of the largest in Web3 today. Um, we have a huge supportive system of storage providers. Some of you might are here in Korea, uh, as well as many other parts of the world. So that has been what we've been building for about six years or so, coming to seven years. Um, so we have a lot of really good systems and hardware to store your data. Step two is to then onboard important data onto this network. So we are very focused on programs like the Filecoin Stingshot program, where we can upload huge, huge sets of data onto the Filecoin network and to keep it stored there for a really long time. Now, step three is where we think about bringing computation to the data. So if you are familiar with Web2 AWS servers, um, if you think about the server architecture where you have a database and then you have uh, an ability to build applications and write logic, that will be the computation part, and then it serves it through a gateway to your client. We hope to be able to create something like that for Web3 so that we can revolutionize the Web3 ecosystem and help bring the whole Web3 more mainstream than it is today. So that's where we think FVM is going to make a huge difference. Um, I will explain a little bit more about the different technologies that I just thought about, but that is the vision that we have for Filecoin, and that is why the FVM is going to enable a lot more solutions to be built. So running through the evolution of storage on the Filecoin network, um, starting from IPFS, which I think everybody here is more familiar with, all the way to our latest piece, which is FVM over there on the layer one. So to make some differentiation, sometimes we get questions around what is the difference between Filecoin, IPFS, FVM. So let's run through a little bit of that difference before I show you an example of how you can use the Filecoin virtual machine in your applications today. So first we have IPFS, which is a peer-to-peer -peer storage network. This is not a blockchain. This is uh, how you would see like you have different kinds of nodes and you can keep sharing your data across these nodes and to keep copies of your data across the peer-to-peer uh, -peer network. Um, there are some examples of this and I'll run through them in my next slide. On top of that, and separate from IPFS, which is a peer-to-peer, -peer, we have the blockchain um, Filecoin protocol. So Filecoin itself is a layer zero, and that is our storage network, like what I just shared earlier on. So this would be a blockchain where we store uh, metadata about your storage deals that you have made with our different storage providers that store your data off-chain. I'll talk a little bit more of that difference later on to help everyone get a clearer picture of what it is that we mean when we say they are different. On top of that layer zero, you have a layer one, which is the Filecoin virtual machine. So this is really new. We launched back in March 14th, 2023. Uh, it's 314, so that is Pi Day. Um, it was a really good launch for us. Um, that is focused on computation over state. Um, I will explain later what I mean by computation over state, but it is a part of the Filecoin network. And then on top of that is the layer two, where we hope to see more of the community and more of the ecosystem building applications based on what we have provided with the layer zero and the layer one. 
So you are able to access your storage, you are able to write logic around your storage, and that will allow you to build applications uh, that are either storage-focused or could be, could be more DeFi. It is up to you. There are many, many things that you can do with the FEM. So that is how we have evolved our storage solutions over time, and that, is the that, that complements the vision for the Filecoin master plan that I shared earlier on. So um, let's get into the geeky part, right? Let's talk a little bit about the diagrams, and I, I hope it gives everyone a little bit more um, cool takeaways from today's talk, and you'll know a little bit more about IPFS, Filecoin, and Filecoin Virtual Machine. So running through some diagrams, these are the differences. This is IPFS. Um, like I said earlier on, these are nodes, right? So there are a few ways that you can store your data on IPFS. You can choose to run your own node, so just the client's own node. You run one node on your own. So you store your data one time on one single node. Um, if one day your node setup fails, your data might disappear. Um, or you will have to take the responsibility to run your node forever to make sure that your data is stored forever. So that's up to you. If you can do that, that is a really cost-efficient way to store your data. Um, if you want to run it with a bunch of your friends, uh, no, a bunch of your own nodes, so you want, like, let's say, 10 replicas of your data to make sure that if one node drops, you will still have your data replicated on other nodes, but you are in charge of running all these nodes. So you can do it in that way as well. Or you can choose to run it with a community that, is, let's say, your community is able to run nodes on their own. You can share the responsibility to store a piece of data multiple times. Right? Again, this is dependent on your community continuing to run their nodes for the long time that you need to store your data. So if your community maybe stops running or people of your community stop participating, you might not be able to store your data for the long term. So these first three options are all free. Right? So these are all cost-efficient ways to store your data on the IPFS network. Um, if you want to have a paid service, we have options like Infura and um, was Pinata and Infura that you can use, which are paid pinning services. What that means is that they will run their own node system and you pay them to continue to store your data for a long time. Um, these are also really useful, even though we have the FVM today and the Filecoin network, because you, when you store and you pin your data to IPFS, you pin, let's say you store it on Filecoin and you pin a copy onto IPFS, IPFS allows for much faster retrievals of your data. So it's still very much complementary technology, but this is the difference between what you have on a peer-to-peer -peer network versus a blockchain. So now we come to Filecoin, which is the blockchain protocol that I talked about earlier on. This is our layer zero. So um, I'll talk about the process on top first. So if you think about it, let's say you are the client and you have a piece of data you want to store. You will make a deal with your storage provider. The emoji there with sunglasses, that will be your storage provider because they are cool. And you will make a storage deal with them. The deal is put into an escrow um, and it's put onto the Filecoin network. So your, and then your file transfer happens off-chain of a, se uh, a separate process. You can choose either BitSwap, you can choose HTTP, then you can get your files sent over from a client to a storage provider. So what happens to the storage deal that you have made? The storage deal that you have made gets stored on the Filecoin blockchain. So if you think about the blockchain over here, um, sorry, the best I emoji that I could find was the chain, but you all know what I mean. You can store your storage deals um, details and metadata, we call them metadata, so like how long you want to store your storage for, how big is the file size, all of those data, you can store it onto the Filecoin on-chain. So uh, because it is very expensive to store large amounts of data on-chain, so we're storing just the metadata. This is a very important part when we talk about Filecoin virtual machine later on. So on the, on the off-chain side of it, you will have your storage provider network that has their own hardware. Each of these storage providers choose how they want to store your data, but every 24 hours, they will have to prove that they are storing your data and they have to prove it back to the chain to show it's called proof of space time to ensure that your data is being stored. And so that is how the Filecoin uh, layer zero works. And now we move on to the layer one, which is FEM. So this whole portion over here we have covered in the previous slide, right? Up to the blue color part, that is the Filecoin layer zero. Now on top of that, you have the Filecoin virtual machine. That would be a layer one. So remember what I said earlier on about your storage deals, metadata being stored on the Filecoin protocol? The Filecoin virtual machine computes and writes logic around the metadata itself. So it doesn't actually write or compute the data that is stored on the storage provider network. It computes the logic, uh, it computes the metadata of your storage deals on the Filecoin chain. 
So this can be super efficient because it is lower cost, it is more performant, it is much faster, rather than you choosing to unseal the data, pull out data, compute it, and, and, one, and decide how you want to move that data around. Why not just move the metadata instead? So that is really the concept behind FVM. And there are a lot of different things that you can do at a layer two solution. So right now, we are very focused on building a rich application ecosystem for developers to build solutions. Um, so there are composable parts that you can build. So we have like computation enabled decentralized computation that you can send a job from your from writing using FVM to write a job from using your data set to send it across to a decentralized computation framework, have it train an AI model, whatever it is that you want to do for computation, and send it back to your application via FVM. So FVM is really like a coordinator in that case. Right. There are also things that you can do around encryption and access control. So you can choose to access control your data with FEM and only allow people who reach a certain criteria or pay a certain amount to access your data. And then lastly, it also enables a whole bunch of DeFi use cases. We, are, we have DEXs, AMMs coming on board right now. We have a few cross-chain liquidity bridges like Sela integrated with FEM today. So there's a lot of things that you can do in the DeFi space with FEM that taps on the liquidity and the collateral that is locked today in the Filecoin protocol. So a huge opportunity there if you are interested in the DeFi space. Um, to give you a sense, we have about one about two million fill locked up in smart contracts today since we launched two and a half months ago. So we're seeing a really healthy usage and adoption of FVM. And we have about 1.1 thousand unique contracts, FVM contracts deployed today to the Filecoin protocol. Cool, so I hope that gave you a better sense of how those three technologies interact with each other. Um, a little bit of a diagram over here. I won't go too, too deep into it, but for those of you who are developers, um, talking about the architecture of FVM, um, right now we are fully EVM compatible. So I just talked about having a Filecoin virtual machine as a layer one on top of the Filecoin, node, uh, Filecoin network. So every Filecoin node can run an instance of the FVM. When you run an instance, it works this way in this architecture. Um, why I zoomed into the EVM compatible part, because I know our, e our Ethereum community is large. We have been doing multiple hackathons with them so far. We are fully EVM compatible, so if you are a Solidity developer, you can use the tools that you are very comfortable with, like Metamask, Foundry, Hardhat, to write Solidity contracts that can call methods to the Filecoin protocol via a Filecoin.Solidity library. Um, and then you can start to run your applications and build applications that looks like an EVM, uses all the tools you're familiar with, and then deploys it to the Filecoin network to access your storage. This is, um, sometimes I get the question, why use FVM's EVM compatible version rather than just use EVM and write to storage? The difference is that if you're using an FVM contract and you're writing to a separate storage platform, you cannot customize that storage platform as much. And it's also more expensive because it's not within a native environment and you are using a separate service. With EVM, um, compatibility on FVM, you can write it all within a native environment, and so it leads to better performance, lower cost, and better security. So there's a lot of good um, benefits of using FVM to um, the FVM EVM compatible version. So on the roadmap as well, we have a few things coming in. We have uh, new storage deal aggregation standards coming in. So that allows you to upload any size of data that you want that can be more efficiently stored into the Filecoin network. Um, we have storage deal replication, repair, and renewal, which will unlock use cases like perpetual storage, ensuring that you don't have to manually check whether your deal is going to expire. It will automate, uh, automatically notify you that it's going to expire and help you to renew the deal based on the, on the conditions that you set uh, for your solution. Uh, we're also looking at building native WASM actors. So right now, uh, EVM compatibility is a foreign runtime for us. So it is one foreign runtime, and we're hoping to build more. We are VM agnostic, and we hope to build more compatibility with other chains in the future, such as Solana and so on, so that we are unlocking storage for more communities out there. Um, and then lastly, we have a lot more partner integrations and toolings and VMs coming up in our roadmap as well. So we're constantly working on that. So a lot of building in that space. We have about uh, 50 applications that have deployed to mainnet so far using FVM in just two and a half months. So we've had a, a huge community adoption and we're super excited to see more of the growth of FVM for Filecoin. Okay, so I know I talked a lot about the context, the infrastructure, how these things work. So one question to answer is what can FVM solve? 
right? Uh, I talked a lot about, uh, Sarah, you talked a lot about the technology. What actually is it going to be used for? So I'll run through a really simple example of a data DAO. So data DAOs are a very unique concept that we think can tap on the, val the very unique value of Filecoin as a storage platform to allow you to build a solution like a data DAO. Uh, data is super useful to all of us today. Um, what a data DAO is defined as is a community like a DAO. I'm sure we all know what a DAO is. And you're very focused on an important data set to you. So it could be, for example, like a Wikipedia, if you want to keep that that you want to keep contributions coming into the, to the data on Wikipedia as a whole data set. Maybe you want to access control and encrypt some of that data set to um, allow people to pay for usage of that data set so that you can earn money for your DAO. There's just so many things you can do. Um, this diagram over here, which is a cake, um, it kind of shows what we're thinking about, how we're thinking about building data DAOs. There are two layers. The first layer over here will be around perpetual storage, so making, that you're, making sure that your storage is well taken care of. And then the layer on top of that is what you would usually see in a DAO, around like governance, tokens, endowment management on your treasury, which, is, which then interacts seamlessly with the storage layer, which is the layer one over here. And this is something that's super unique to FVM, um, and that's what you can do with the Filecoin network today. So I'll run through a quick example. Uh, I was thinking examples are fun. Um, so this is an example, it's not real. I hope that it becomes real one day. But an example of a data DAO is, let's say you, uh, we call it biscuit data DAO. By the way, this is the, this mascot is the corgi mascot for Filecoin. We call it biscuit. Um, so we're calling it biscuit data DAO. So let's say you have a community of corgi dog owners that want to collect enough data to better understand their corgis and how they behave. So, um, I, I mean, I have a dog. I don't know if anybody here has a dog. Yeah, any dog owners in the audience? Cool, cool, cool. Yes, great. Awesome. OK, so you should relate to this more, right? Hopefully, this gets built up for all of us. Um, so what do you do with that data set, right? Here's what you can do. So with FEM, there are, we have seen hackathon projects that have started to build using FEM to ZK verify that the contributor to the data set is a real person. So I want to make sure that your pet ID is real. Right? So you can upload that. You don't have to showcase your pet ID. It is completely private. You can ZK verify that that exists. Maybe you can cross-check with a data system, submit the proof, um, confirm that this contributor is real. And then that allows them to then ex uh, upload data to the data set and participate in the DAO. So now you're a member of the DAO. Right? You can use FVM to upload your Corgi's information. Um, maybe let's say you upload it from Monday to Friday. Uh, you take note of your Corgi's behavior, and then you upload that to the data DAO. Right? So you're submitting your information up there. What happens then is that your data gets stored by um, the FVM being able to automatically store that. So it will collect all this data, batch it into the right size, and then upload it to the Filecoin network and make a storage deal on behalf of the DAO without you having to do anything. So this all happens in the back end, because previously, before FVM, this was a bit more manual, and so it took more time. But now it's automatic, right? So you're actually getting a very fast and easy way to upload your data and get it stored. It will also submit proofs back to you to verify that your data is continuously being stored. So that happens more on the back end. But as, as the Corgi owner, what happens is that once you upload your data, let's say the condition for the DAO is that you upload it five days in a row. So you're confirming like a streak. Because if I can observe data five days in a row, then I can see a pattern. So you want to incentivize the right behavior in your DAO. You can set your governor uh, contract to have certain conditions on when you would reward that kind of behavior. So let's say you upload it for five days in a row. You would then get tokens minted from the DAO to your pet owner, to, to the Corgi owner, which is you. So now you are a Corgi owner, and you have all these tokens from the DAO. You can now participate in voting. So that allows you to vote. What, what could you possibly vote on? So there are two things that you can maybe do as an example. Um, on the top, you can vote to allow um, to send that data set to a decentralized computation framework to train an AI model to get better um, responses on what it means to when your Corgi behaves in a certain way. So if let's say we have 100 contributors on the DAO, all, all contributing to a data set, we have a very good data set. We send it to, an, to a computation framework that then generates and trains the AI model. And then on the front end for your DAO, you can always key in Today, my corgi is not eating its food. What does that mean? And then it will send the, the query to the AI model, uh, generate a response, and send it back to the DAP front end. And this is all done. The coordination part of this is done with Filecoin Virtual Machine. 
So you could do that. Uh, you can also vote to provide access control on top of your data set. So I talked about this a little bit earlier on. You can make people pay to access all the great data that your DAO is collecting. So if, let's say, Google or, I don't know, a pet facility wants to access that data, they can actually pay your DAO, and it can go towards your DAO treasury to access the data that is being stored. Um, so let's say your DAO treasury now has more money. Right? There are also things that you can do with that money. Right? This would be the endowment management part. So your treasury could then fund the renewal and uh, repair and replication of your data set to make sure that that Corgi data set, all your hard work to contribute to that data set, doesn't disappear overnight. Or it can remain for a very, very long time. So you can continuously you know, have a model that generates funds for your treasury, the treasury pays for renewal, and then your data is stored for a really long time. So your DAO can continue perpetually. Um, and once your treasury has money, it can also unlock all the DeFi use cases that you're interested in. So for example, it could connect to a marketplace of services where your DAO members with more tokens are able to swap those tokens for um, whatever currency that a real-life marketplace is accepting. And then let's say my Corgi is sick. Uh, I want to exchange my tokens to access a VET service, for example. And that can connect to your DAO and that can allow your whole DAO to be like a really good use case as a community. So there are just a lot of things that you can do. I think the possibilities are endless. I just wanted to give you a little example of what you can think about for a data DAO. Um, other examples that we've seen in hackathons are things like um, collecting credit card data, you know, we credit, collecting credit card data, making sure that it's kept private, and then being able to sell that credit card data to credit card companies. And so you're actually owning your data, and you actually get the tokens back directly to all these users. So endless use cases, I just wanted to spark some inspiration. We have a lot of good resources about how we're thinking about these things, and you can check them out. I'll give you a QR code. You can check them out later on to see what you want to build um, after this. So yeah, the result is that you get healthier and happier corgis. So that, that's a really easy example for how you can think about data DAO. I hope that it was fun. Uh, I, really, I hope this gets built. If anyone's building this, please let me know. And um, just to show you, we are trying to develop a more um, rich developer dev ecosystem. So we are integrating more and more tools that you can use. These are some of the partners that we already have integrated with FVM. Um, aside from Sushi, we're still working on that one. That should be coming through soon. Um, but yeah, a lot more partners are coming on board. So we'll have, uh, I think every single month, we'll have more integration partners coming on board that you can use with FVM. And if you're interested to find out more, um, this is a really good QR code. It has, it's a link tree. It has all links to documentation, use case ideas, and how we're thinking about it, and how other teams are building on FVM today, as well as how you can get involved with the community of builders that we have. We have a super strong community of builders who are highly technical. So if you want to come in and join, just you know, learn more yourself, do feel free to check out these resources and get in touch with the team. And lastly, just a huge thank you to all of you for listening to about learning something about FBM today. I hope it was useful. Um, this is my whole team, and there are more people as well. I'm just one member of the team, and we have great partners that we're working with as well. So thank you all for listening. <laughs>